September 14th, night time. Tapcom announced separate ways. Somehow, I'm still surprised. Resident Evil 4 was released on January 11th, 2005 for the GameCube console. Nine months later, on October 25th of the same year, Capcom released a port of RE4 for the PS2, the first port of many more to come. Besides the game itself, one of the most awaited themes was the new mini-scenario called Separate Ways, starring Ada Wong. Fast forward to 2023, a midweek after the announcement, Separate Ways suddenly released on September 21st. As the remake, it has had an incredible good reception, even though it's been only a week. Like the original, we follow the steps of Miss Wong into understanding why and what she's doing in this isolated Spanish village. But unlike the original, Separate Ways has much more to offer. New gameplay elements, places, stories, and some great surprises were added. In today's video, I decided to separate Ada's journey on five different points. 1. A quick recap of the original Separate Ways. 2. The history behind the making of the original Separate Ways. 3. A recap of the remake Separate Ways. 4. A review slash rambling about the new version of the game. Finally, my thoughts of the future of the franchise. So, Miss Wong, please take us into the... Separate Ways. Ada, who is already in the village, tell us that she's here with only one objective. After doing some cool spy moves, we receive a call from Wesker, who recommends us to ring the bell to calm the villagers. He also requests that we gather as much data as possible about the parasites and get out ASAP. We hear shots and it's Leon, who is trying to contain the villagers. Here we receive our first official mission, ring the church bell. After I remember how to play the game, Seeing Leon casually running around without noticing us and doing some fan kicks, we are introduced to Ada's unique mechanic, the hookshot. In order to continue, a random chicken lays the insignia key on a rooftop, because... Warning, this section of the video has a lot of because and reasons. We go inside the building and we encounter the merchant. Even though he is an open jet, he is willing to buy and sell to us. Sadly, we cannot upgrade any of our weapons, which isn't a deal breaker, but later on it will cause a minor issue. Remember this. We get to the church, but in order to get in, we need a special key. We demolish one of the chainsaw sisters and we get the key item to get into the church. We go inside, pick more ass, and solve the same light puzzle as we do as Leon. Finally, we ring the bell and save Leon. After finishing a chapter, Ada will explain more about the situation, sometimes doing a little bit of flash forward. In this particular one, she theorizes that the staff that Sadly has creates some type of sound waves to control other parasites. How does she know? Easy! Reasons! The, the most probable thing is that she was fed information throughout her employer, the organization. Here, she lays the truth. She needs a sample to give to the organization in order to prove or disprove those theories. Also, she wants to prove her loyalty. Wesker tells us that Luis has been kidnapped so we need to rescue him to get the sample. We start the chapter on Vitores Mendes' house, because... Also, the merchant is right there because, well, reasons. After we avoid some dynamite, we see some ganados carrying L and L. Not you, L, Leon and Luis, jeez. We go and rescue our doofus, and here I realized something. How much I dislike the enemy's original voice acting. You see, for some reason the voice director, or the person in charge of that, thought it was a great idea to give Mexican accents to all the enemies, 
who are villagers from a secluded place from Spain. It's not a big deal, but it's really annoying when video games don't respect the Spanish language. Having said that, thank you Capcom for revising this on the remake. Anyhow, we continue tracking the doofus and back in the village, we absolutely destroyed the dude who stole Leon's jacket. After that, we see a cutscene of Leon going inside Vitor's house and here they canonize the first official appearance of Ada. After shooting Vitores and saving Leon, something very lame happens. A ganado with a tranquilizer quickly shot us and we faint. We awake in the middle of a ritual and we receive a very shitty cutie. I forgot how terrible RE4 QDEs can be. This time, we dodge the attack I rearrange the bot's items We write the card And easily win the fight against the Gigante After that, we encounter Luis, who's leaving the house after defending it alongside Leon. Ada requests the sample, which Luis doesn't currently have. Ada, on her thoughts, makes interesting remarks about Luis. He doesn't work with anyone, and she, for some reason, likes him. She intercepts an email that he sent to a friend, requesting help. She says that he did his own investigation about the cult and Las Plagas, because he is a brilliant scientist, who then was recruited by Sadler. We make a sudden teletransportation to the castle because you. Here we see the iconic meeting that Leon and Ada have, and then something incredible dumb happens. She runs to the labyrinth and receives orders from Wesker to get the sample from Luis and kill Leon only to immediately go back to the exact same room where we escaped from. Why? Well, because <coughs> you. We explore the castle, do more bot item organization, we use a grenade to properly fight this PS Garador fight, and we encounter Leon fighting some ganados. It's very clear that Ara doesn't want to kill him, so we bypass that area and we have to witness Luis Dumb's death. Here, for some stupid reason, Highly trained martial artist and spy, Ada Wong makes one of the most baffling choices I ever seen on a video game. She calls Wesker meters away from Leon. Like, girl, he can 100% hear you, even if you whisper. You could have just used your hookshot and called him on the roof. Jeez. Anyhow, Wesker is cool that she hasn't completed either of her missions. On her report, she says that Wesker sent her and Krauser as spies and that she can easily take him down, though she will take advantage that Krauser succumbed to the temptation of Las Plagas. Once again, we inexplicably teletransport, this time to the island. Krauser and Ada threaten each other. Curiously enough, she receives a call from Wesker and she mentions that Leon is busy rescuing Ashley. Wait, what? How does she even know about Ashley and that Leon is here doing that? As far as I'm aware, the only interaction they have was back at the castle and there wasn't any hint during the entire playthrough or a cutscene where she mentions that. She just knows because, once again, Q. We ran through the same highway that earlier Ashley and Leo were escaping from with a bulldozer. Here we encounter the biggest bullshit moment of separate ways. In order to continue, we need to go through some warships that have miniguns and missiles. After using some keys, we can use a minigun to destroy the other ones. 
it's very complicated to know where to go, so you have to tank some shots to figure out what to do. The biggest BS moment is when you go to the door close to the end and suddenly there's a f***ing minigun that spans in your face. What the f***? It's easy to evade it, but once we do so and get the red key, it's unclear what to do next. After we tank even more ridiculous damage and destroy the missiles and miniguns, we adventure further into the island. After demolishing more ganados, we arrive just in time to save Leon. Here, there's another sudden QTE, which naturally, I fail. By the way, I found a cool interview of Yoshiaki Hirabayashi, made by the magazine Play back in January 2005. Hirabayashi was the event team head and lead designer. Also, he was in charge of the cutscenes of the entire game. Play asked him to describe one of his favorite scenes and why he thought it worked so well. He answered, My favorite scene would have to be the scene with the knife fight. I think it really recreates the tension of a close quarters knife fight, but at the same time, you can just put down the controller and watch it to the end. When the enemy charges at Leon, you have to become Leon and dodge the attack. When Leon is putting up a fight, you have to put up a fight too. Mr. Hirabayashi, I don't want to be an idiot, but let me say, this age like spoiled milk, because thank God that we shun deaths to keep doing QTEs, and I hope that it stays like that. QTEs are, without a doubt, one of the worst mechanics that widespread like a disease. I'm gonna make a little flash forward, but the fight with El Gigante on the remake has nice animations, zero QTE, and I still felt like I was playing as Ada. This sudden QTE reminds me of an unforgiving one from Bayonetta. If you have ever played it, you know which one. Back to the recap, I passed the QTE and now it makes a little bit more sense why Krauser was so upset with Ada. On her thoughts, she mentions that she knew that Ashley was abducted, which makes narrative sense. But on the storytelling part, it's really dumb that this is mentioned here and not in an earlier chapter. We start the finale while Mike helps Leon. Wesker requests a report and Ada tells him that Krauser died and Leon is still alive. He presses her to get the sample and kill him. Here happens the minor issue I mentioned earlier. Since we cannot upgrade our weapons, money starts to be useless as early as chapter 2. We are able to sell whatever we want to, but there isn't a real good reason why to do that. By the end of the game, I end up having more than 100k pesetas and nothing to use them for. I know that you can unlock the Chicago typewriter, but it's still kinda lame. With our large pockets and even larger ammunition, we just annihilate anything that crosses our path. After that, we have our third encounter with Leon, where he briefly succumbs to the power of Las Plagas, which we quickly snap out of it. Here she mentions something interesting that he has to get out the parasite. How does she know that? Did the organization told her? Why didn't she freak out that he is infected? So many questions with little answers. We poke El Regenerador and we continue. While exploring, Ada quickly evades a huge metal pipe that Krauser throws. She has to finish him off, so we do a last fight against him on the rooftops. I decided to cheat, so I made the same strategy as Leon. Come on. Words like a charm. Afterwards, we end up being at the exact same place as Leon. He's about to rescue Ashley and we bought him some time. Here we have the last boss fight of the game, Sadler. It's a pain to fight him. It took me four times and the last one, I used a combination of guns and the knife, which was better than just shooting. 
Sadler drops the sample, but he still traps us. We woke up later, being saved by Liam. Sadler transforms himself, and Liam prepares to destroy him. Meanwhile, we need to Spider-Man our way to help Leon and give him the red rocket launcher. Leon finishes off Sadler and Ada gets the sample. She runs away from Leon, jumping to the helicopter and throwing him the keys of the water bike. How and why was a rocket launcher there? How did the helicopter dude knew Ada's exact location? Where did she get the keys for the water bike? Well, the answer for all those questions is very simple. You. Well, that was it, pals. Separate ways. As you can tell, I really never like it, since it feels like they had no idea why and how Ada was there. Sure, she wanted to get the sample, but other than that, they truly never asked themselves how and why. Separate ways always felt like an afterthought to me. In fact, this is a great opportunity to tackle that. Let's see the behind the scenes. Separate ways was an afterthought. I am not exaggerating. It literally was. You see, Mikami didn't like too much the idea of losing Nintendo's exclusivity. As early as 2003, fans were already concerned about not being able to play the game, especially Sony fans. But more importantly, shareholders started to press the company to release a port of RE4 to the PS2 because they thought that they were gonna make more money on the Sony market. Nevertheless, days before the release, they officially announced that the game would actually receive a port and they would need around 9 months to make it possible. Apparently, Mikami and other devs weren't too keen on doing that, plus Capcom was having some internal issues. All of this led Mikami to not work on more RE games, choosing to step aside and making clear that he and other devs weren't gonna do the port. Producer Masachita Kawata was chosen to be the leader and continue the port. Even though Mikami wasn't happy about the situation, he was open to help Kawata, who always went to Mikami seeking out advice. While the port was happening, Writer Haruo Murata, Alonsai Kawata, and other members responsible for making the port requested Mikami permission to add some new stuff to the port. They had a big request. They wanted to make a new and original scenario with Ada Wong called Separate Ways. While Leon was the focus of the game, they never explored the reasons behind Ada being there, so they wanted to do that. Mikami suggested and gave them his blessing. And if you are wondering, it's not like they needed Mikami's permission, but come on, he was the director. Of course they're gonna ask him permission before adding anything new. As I mentioned, the devs were able to make this a reality because 9 months later, on October 25th, 2005, they released RE4 for the PS2, which in less than 6 months will sell more than 1.6 millions of units, and even to this day, the game is still praised for all the new directions that it took. Reading the story and making of RE4 is very interesting. We may have forgotten it, but back in 2003, the Resident Evil formula was stagnant. We needed to remember Resident Evil, Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, Resident Evil Code Veronica, Resident Evil Remake, and Resident Evil Zero were pretty much the same. Of course, the graphics, characters, some mechanics and stories are different, but if we lump together all these six games, they're pretty much the same. People were sick of zombies, pre-rendered backgrounds and the same mechanics for the games. That's why Resident Evil 3.5 was halt and overhauled. Not only a new franchise was born, but Resident Evil as a franchise had an entire revolution since Mikami was afraid that people wouldn't like the game and he was worried that they were unable to go past the stagnation. It always hurts me to see 3.5 because it's so spooky and cool, but in the long run, it was the wisest choice. Why am I talking about that and what that has anything to do with separate ways? Well, it's really obvious that the main focus of RE4 is the gameplay. That's why they didn't care too much about the story, being truthful to a language and their customs, or worse, explaining why the psychic character was there. 
In an interview done to Kawata by Game Informer on September 17, 2005, he was asked, let's talk about separate ways. Was this your idea? How it all come about? We wanted to really add something to the game, and one of those things we realized was that Ada shows up in the game later. But you don't know much about her, and she's a very strong character, and she deserves to really stand out in the game. So, this wasn't something that didn't make the cut in the GameCube version? Actually, this wasn't part of any of the GameCube specs or anything like that. It wasn't something that was able to be put into the GameCube version. It actually was a new idea that we came up with while working on the port for the PS2. For example, the director and I and a few other people were talking about it and that's when the idea first came about. Of course, we did consult with the original director, Mikami, and a few other people to make sure that it did flesh in with the game right. But it's actually a new idea that came out of the PS2 version port. So, not only the main focus of Resident Evil 4 was the overhaul of the combat and tossing aside the zombies in favor of scary villagers that tall back and evade your attacks, but the need to be different from the previous games. They needed to do that to avoid being behind. That's why Separate Ways feels so lackluster. Don't get me wrong though, because they didn't charge extra for anything for the new things that they added. And looking back, it's really impressive what they achieved in 9 months. Not only a faithful port, but an insane one with many more things to look forward to than the original. But I really cannot shake the feeling that it lacks a lot of the charisma and charm that you have while playing as Leon. Gameplay wise, you really never feel like you're playing this super cheeky and badass spy. Ada is pretty much a skin of Leon with light differences. Other than different animations for her kicks, having a hookshot that you really won't use that much, and a way over the top climbing animation, Separate Ways didn't explain that much of how Ada navigated Las Plagas situation. More than once, she magically gets teleported. For some reason, Vitores didn't take the chance to kill her, and straight up, she makes dumb decisions. Okay, I'm going to be honest, I only played Separate Ways once, the very first time I played RE4 around 2010. Even when I played RE4 a couple of months ago to prepare myself for the remake, I didn't touch Separate Ways. Before playing this new iteration of Ada, I chose to replay it, and all my memories came back. It feels like a hot mess and a disservice to Ada. Imagine waiting 6 or 7 years to finally play a direct sequel to RE2, especially with Ada, and this is what we got. It's a shame. An impressive one though, considering the insane backstory that probably you didn't even know. Finally, it took me around 3 hours to beat it. You can easily beat it with less time, but I died some couple of times and I got a little stuck fighting sadly. Funnily enough, according to Kawara, the internal tests they made tended to take at least 5 hours. I'm not sure why, because it's even more linear than the main scenario, and the only moment that you get Ganados to spawn forever is at the very beginning before ringing the bell. The game is fun, and if you don't want or you don't care about storytelling, sure, you can fully enjoy this as much as playing as Leon. Before continuing our adventure, I want to give thanks to today's not sponsor, subscribe. If you ever feel like watching a new YouTuber playing some great games like Bloodburn, or you just want to see some occasional reviews but you can't stand videos that aren't edited, you're in luck. I also made this adorable dot Leon. In fact, I would love it if anyone that sees this video makes their own one and send it to me through your preferred social media. If I get enough of this, I will promise to make a video rating all of them. So, what are you waiting for? Go ahead, subscribe and like this video. We start on the castle with Luis. He's dancing, accepting his fate. And Ada is dressed up as a cult member to free him? Holy shit, hold on a second. Before continuing, I have to say, what a way to start. Instead of Ada being already in the village alongside Leon, she's actually in the castle, saving Luis's ass. 
I haven't controlled Ada yet, and I already love it more than the original. Holy hell! We escape the castle's prison, and Ada helps Luis to easily get out while containing Ada's new boss fight, El Verdugo. But wait a moment, this isn't truly El Verdugo. Instead, this is Ramon's other hand, Pesanta. You see, in the original, she is taken alongside Ramon, and they combine to be the final boss of the castle. It was very clear that she was missing while playing as Leon, so making she Ada's pursuit was a great call. Luis screams that they should meet at the church while escaping, and Ada seemingly defeats everyone, but of course, the boss survives and she hits Ada with some residue. While fighting her, we start to suddenly hallucinate, and after choosing the real one, we're able to scare her off. Ada reports to Wesker that she still doesn't have the amber. After that, we have something new for Ada. She's wearing some type of special eye contact that changes her vision and allows her to easily see points of interest. It's also connected to Wesker's machine, so in essence, he sees what we see. Also, this is the new way to tell the player where they can use the grapple gun. We fight our way out of the castle and we quickly head towards the village. The game starts with Ada saying that the Amber is an object of bad omen and that she's worried of the terrible uses they will do to it. She mentions that she made her peace with things like that until everything changed that fateful night in Raccoon City. She cleverly fights more ganados until she reaches a place where she can talk with Wesker. She asks why they're so aggressive, which he answers that it is because the president's daughter is there. Ada goes through the house where Leon and Luis will eventually hold their ground, and she uses her grapple gun to be on the roof as a vantage point. She sees Leon holding up the villagers at the beginning of the game. Unlike the original, instead of being there with him, she sees another route to go to the church. After traversing this new area, she quickly reaches the church, but unlike the original where you actually go inside it, this time she directly goes to the bell and rings it, assuring Leon's survival. Sounds like he could use a little help. As a fun fact, if you go back to where the merchant will have his shop, you can hear the commotion and Leon's gunshots. Ada waits for Luis, but he doesn't appear, so she's contacted by Wesker, who requests her to save him. She deduces that he is nearby Vitores Mendes house. Before leaving, we go into one of the side doors of the church, where she realizes that Leon is here to save Ashley. We deal with the ganados who came to the church and we have a nice interaction with the merchant, who immediately turns into our ally. Hey, stranger. So what do you buy? You've picked quite the place to set up shop, stranger. Aye. And look what it brought me. An incredible surprise is that there is an updated version of the merchant's theme. What an interesting choice. Oh, I mean it in a good way, of course. <laughs> you can't go wrong with that. After freaking out hearing a new merchant's theme, Called Serenity, we go into the village and what's going on? Well, you wanted separate ways, now you have it. Big. Again, holy hell, I cannot believe that we have a second fight in the middle of the village. Something that I realized while writing this script is that this was a nice nod to RE 3.5, since Leon also hallucinates on that trailer. Instead of having a hookman, it's Pesant. After some headshots, kicks, and knifing, we are able to gain the upper hand, though we suffer a headache before doing the final blow. We go back to our quest, and when we arrive at Vitore's house, we save Leon. 
Instead of being randomly teleported, we wait a little bit until Vitores and Leon leaves. We go inside his house to find information about Luis's whereabouts. We found a note that he is in the factory basement, the place where we will find him as Leon. After getting the note, we leave. We have no option but to run away from him. There is no we go inside the factory to find the ganado that Leon totally demolished. Here, we finally find information about Ara's new eye contacts, IRIS, which stands for Interactive Retinal Inquire System. We unlock a new gameplay element. On certain occasions, we will need to track someone. We just press a button and Ara will track. It's nothing mind-blowing, and it's pretty much like Horizon. We follow Luis's tracks, which lead to a pack of cigarettes. He has numbers which Ara deduces that it is his frequency. We call him and she requests the amber. He tells her to go to the big house that, once again, both him and Leon will make this stand. While leaving, we pause out from whatever is happening to us, probably getting captured in the process. After we wake up, we are at Vitore's house. Having a bad day. Wesker rescued us. Wesker, to what do I owe this pleasure? Stop wasting my time, Ada. Find Lewis. Fetch me the amber. No, I'm not kidding. King Wester appeared out of nowhere and literally rescued us. I decided to call this as Wesker et Machina. I guess that this is the way to make up for that god awful moment when that random ganado shoots us with a tranquilizer. We continue our journey and we arrive near the house which all the ganados are trying to get in, but we can't continue since right there they bring a gigante. Again, I love how they integrate things from the original in a very credible and seamless way. This gigante was sent to destroy everyone at the house, so we must stop him. Sorry, big guy. Can't let you go that way. Afterwards, Luis and Ada meet up in an encounter that we previously saw on the main game. Ada and Luis go back to the castle and she gets impatient that he doesn't have the amber. She threatens him and eventually he spills the beans that both Leon and Ashley are infected, which Ada clearly doesn't care. Luis retorts saying that she should, since she is infected as well. Remember that first fight against Pesanta? She infected us right there. We follow him to his laboratory, which, unfortunately, is set up on fire. Luis is clearly distressed, but Ada encourages him to use his scientific background to make new sedatives, which he agrees with. We have a Mifid's quest, 
we need to gather three components, red ink, gold bottle, and blue butterfly. While we do that, Chris will get the amber. We know that Ada clearly succeeds gathering those items because Luis gave Leon those sedatives in the mines. While hunting the red ink, we had the amazing scene of Ada and Leon's first official encounter. And, unlike the original, Ada doesn't escape only to go back seconds later. Also, before she gets the last part, Luis sends her information about the Amber. Even though in its own suspended animation, it can still influence other parasites and holds great power. Once we get everything, we reunite with Luis, which handles the Amber. But, because we are infected, our parasite resonates with it, so temporarily we cannot have it. He administers the sedative and clarifies once more that it will knock out the parasite, but it's not something permanent. We need to get it out. Before it makes any effect, Pesant appears and we have to go. Ada tells Luis to escape while she holds up against Pesanta. The sedative works and we are able to escape from Pesanta, so our new objective is to find Luis. We track him and his footprint lead us to a chamber that is inaccessible to Leon. We go down and we find a note saying that he's gonna go to the mines with Liam. He leaves a sign so we can continue through the waterways, which are infested with Novistadores. We have a very simple water temple puzzle, and after draining the water and shooting some huge flies, we are able to get out. While there, we got a new item for a rifle, a bion sensor scope. Uh oh, I think you know what it means. After getting out, we encountered a lovely secluded place, a very small arena with one garrador who tied up to a wall and many, many ganados coming in. We continue our journey and we arrive at the upper part of the furnace, the same place where Leon and Luis will fight two gigantes. We are still getting hunted by Pesanta, so we run away to fight it in a proper area. Using her grapple gun, she is able to do massive damage, which, in turn, reveals the true form of this monstrosity, U3. She also has a new second phase where the larva part of it takes over, which obviously we obliterate. After defeating that thing, Ada actually pukes the parasite. You see, earlier we found out that the people infected with Pesanta's Plaga needed to defeat it in order to survive. Obviously, that didn't happen until now. Now, to find Luis. Luis calls Ada and tells her that a bad guy, Krauser, 
stole the amber. He is grateful to her since he did a good deed, but he has now to go and help Leon one last time. We have no other option but to press forward, escaping from this place. Ada heads towards the clock tower. Not only that, but she sees Krauser run away, which she follows. The way she speaks about him let us know that this time they're not working together. We follow Krauser into an area that Leon cannot easily access. This new area, next to the clock tower, is a revamped version of the hive tunnels on the original. Remember that Leon has to run underneath some huge rocks? Well, they added that part here to Ada. After doing all of that, we grapple to the top of the clock tower where we can see Leon shooting Ramon. In turn, she follows Krauser, who has Ashley. We go down to the docks the same way as Leon. As soon as we enter the dock, Krauser is already leaving. We find some keys and Leon quickly enters this place. Once again, a familiar cutscene starts to play. After an awkward conversation with Leon, we continue our quest into getting the Amber. Sadly, we are too late and Krauser handles it to Sadler. While waiting our options, it happens once again. Wesker appears out of nowhere. Let me quickly pause here. What? Wesker not only appears out of nowhere, but if he is there, why doesn't he just do the job? What a bizarre cameo. It would make sense how he's able to come and go, but I still don't understand why he didn't just go in and take the amber. I don't know if he's afraid that Leon will recognize him or that he will be influenced by Sadler or something like that, but it doesn't make much sense. He handles a new quest for Ada, destroying the entire island. Ada infiltrates the facility and after demolish many enemies, she is stuck with a powerless electronic door. We need to gather our power unit from a freezer. We have no other choice but to take another route to go forth. While we do that, unsurprisingly, it found us. After running around and being scared to death, we go into the iconic freezer room and got the power unit. Of course, no power means no electricity, which means no light. Going back into the initial room, we use the power unit and we are able to continue. We got a new objective, going into the comms room. Now, here I scream, literally. I wish I was kidding, but the decks never cut out the lift section. They move it from being a part of Leon and Ashley to being exclusive to Ada on the island. Holy shit! This has to be one of the biggest changes. I mean, it's exactly the same as the original, but the fact that it was moved so far away and it still makes sense inside the story, this is such a brilliant move. After freaking out because they truly didn't cut too much from the original, we arrive at this new big area that is well fortified. It's clearly the remake version of that BS boot moment in the original game. It's nowhere near as complicated and you just have to be clever to avoid becoming Swiss cheese. We stealthily bypass that area, and by stealthily I mean kicking the head out of everyone. We move into an underground area that looks surprisingly familiar. Yes! No way! Yeah! They did it! Again! This is the laser scene! I mean 100% honest with what I am going to say. I cannot believe this cost $10. Not only the prediction quality is way above that what I was expecting, but those little moments that weren't present on the remake were organically introduced here. Capcom, I truly hope that you keep going like this, because this is how a remake and a DLC should be tackled. Going deeper into the facility, we encounter a document talking about a subject that was endlessly tested just like Lisa Trevor, Martinico. The document says that he is impervious to conventional weapons and, of course, less than 20 seconds after reading that, we encounter our new friend.
guess my new friend was the result of some experiment. We pushed forward and the time of the lasers arrived. Lasers. Better watch out. It wasn't that bad, Ada. Finally, we connect Wesker's suitcase into the comms. I'm at the site and jacked into the main terminal. You're going to blow up this entire island. Including the president's daughter. But won't that make things harder for you? There's no room for half measures. The weak exist to serve the strong. Enough talk. Bring me the amber. I've arranged a way for you to get back to the island. Copy that. On it now. Okay, Luis. What was it that you said again? What? what? You should have known by now, Whisker, that I don't always play by your rules. There's nothing else for us to do here but to run. Sadler. Remember that I say that I love QDEs? This is a huge exception. I don't care that this little section was super scripted. This made sense with who Ada is and what she does. Now it's time to get the Amber. We start this chapter at the end of Leo's adventure. Remember that I say that she randomly had some keys for a water bike on the original? Well, here we have our answer. Wesker gave her a way to get out and she used that to give a chance to Leon. We defeat more waves of ganados until we arrive at the exact same place that Leon will fight Sadler. The merchant is already in the same position as when we are with Leon. And just like him, this is the last interaction we have with him. Oi, oi! You better buy something while you can. You may regret it later. I can hardly contain myself. You're really gonna do it, stranger. After his words, we press to rescue Leon. Leon! Go!
will be your trial and tribulation. Sadler Boss fight is easier here than it was on the original, since we can parry most of his attacks. He still does some BS movements, but we defeat him and claim the Amber. Control, come in. I have the package. This is gonna be hard to explain at customs. Well done, Ada. Evacuate immediately. Understood. Someone is coming to pick you up. I trust everything is fine on your end, too. Yeah. We see another familiar scene of Ada and Leon teaming up against Sadler. While Leon takes him down, we go around the buildings like Spider-Man, but before we even grapple to the first building, we see that some ganados are taking some rocket launchers, including a red one. Just what I was looking for. And once we get close to the red rocket launcher, we find the last document of the game. It's a special warhead that Krauser bought for his nefarious purposes. Before going to him, the encounter of the two worlds happens. Leon needs help! Hurry! Use this! And that was it, separate ways. But don't worry, there's a new last post credit scene. Continue, as planned. Soon, the sun will set on the age of man.
Now that we have seen both versions of Ada, let's do a deep down. On both games, we have access to many things like the same weapons and even the same kicks, the fan kick and its variant, a vertical one. On the remake, Ada will do other types of kicks depending on the position of the enemy, how the enemies was staggered, how many enemies are surrounding us, but more importantly, how close we are to the staggered enemy. If you're far away while any enemy is staggered, we will have a prompt to press the action button from afar. Ada will use the hook to close herself to that enemy, throwing a powerful kick in the way. This one even has a variant. If you do it while she has the higher ground, she will do a different animation. Much cooler than the regular fan kick, in my opinion. I was able to do it a couple of times, but each time was super satisfying. The grapple hook is easier to use because in the original, we have to stand in a particular place to be able to interact and use the hook. This time we have IDs, and we can immediately tell where we can grab. We will use this as an advantage, for example, to quickly traverse some places or getting away from the ganados to effortlessly demolish them from afar. A new addition is that in certain battles, the grapple will be essential. One of the moments that shines the most is on El Gigante boss fight. We do this on the farm, indirectly helping Leon and Luis on their stand. But instead of just shooting, we need to do a combination of jumping around and being on foot until La Plaga comes out of El Gigante and blasts it away for extra damage. It was really cool to see how Ara used her knife and the grapple gun in conjunction to destroy the parasite. That boss battle was super fun, but I struggled a little bit because I made dumb choices and El Gigante actually destroyed some of the houses, forcing me to run around like an idiot. Nevertheless, Ada succeeds and it makes it look like nothing. The merchant is back and this time we can actually upgrade our weapons. From the get-go, Ada's knife feels more powerful than Leon's since when you parry, it doesn't go down that fast, but it will drain faster when you use it to destroy any ganado that is transforming on the floor, though once you upgrade the durability, you won't face that issue anymore. In fact, the game will give you a lot of knives at the beginning areas of the game to balance that out. Our weapons repertoire has expanded. You start the game with the same black tail as the original, though it doesn't shoot nowhere near as fast as the original. Later on, you can buy a special Punisher gun and then the Red 9. Also, very early in the game, we find a rifle in the castle, and once we go back there, much later in the story, we can actually buy the automatic one. As the base game, we use spinels for special traits which will become important because you have to use them to buy the little keys to open some drawers, bypassing the frustration of hunting the keys and figuring out where to use them. Another returning mechanic is putting gems on certain treasures. The only difference with the base game is that you will have an excess of gems. My advice is that you should hold on to those treasures and gems until you have a nice combination so you make the most amount of pesetas. Brought back from the base game are the side quests. There are only a handful of them and two of those are destroying blue medallions. Others will request specific items like getting two special beetles on the prison or, fun enough, obtaining Leon's jacket. Finally, charms and colored item boxes are back. Since we don't have a shooting gallery with Ada, the merchant will sell them. Personally, I think the one that matters the most is the charm of Ada herself. When you equip it, the game will give you a prompt every time that you encounter any enemy that wields a shield to use your grapple gun and quickly take it out. The game has puzzles. None of them are particularly difficult and some are straight up fetch quests, like getting the power unit, which it was a nice addition to explain, without saying it, why that entire area was dark. As I mentioned, there's a new addition alongside Iris, a tracking function. We will use it a couple of times and sometimes we actually need it to be able to solve some puzzles. Later on, it will appear on the Martinico chase scene, having to use it on a panel to guess the right number combination. This reminds me a lot when James gets trapped in the cockroach room on Silent Hill 2. A big difference with the original game is the difficulty of the enemies. They will duck 
and move more frequently and pulling them in a stagger position will take more effort. You cannot chase your fights with big enemies like El Doctor Salvador, the Twin Sisters or the Board Variants. It's funny to use the grapple on any of them, but you have to be quick if you don't want to get damage. I never understood why on the original game we only fight with the base enemies but not the Novistadores or los Regeneradores or other types of enemies. As I mentioned, we encounter a new one, Martinico, who, as I said, gives huge Lisa Trevor vibes. I didn't mind that the chase was very short and highly scripted, because it was a clever way to integrate the laser room and it's not there just to take something from the movies. A certain boss fight is missing, Krauser. I think it was a great idea to completely dump both the fight and the storytelling between him and Ada. She knew who he was, but the game dumped that idea that both of them are trying to achieve the same goals in different manners. I found it diminishing that Ada makes a last fight with him after Leon defeats him, so this times it feels like Leon closed that chapter. Luis, like the Vegas game, has an expanded role here as well. It was nice to see him using his charms on Ada, which she clearly doesn't fall for it, but at the same time, I think that she never got annoyed by him. It truly surprised me that the game started in such a wild and different manner, making me feel more connected with both. He is a very interesting character, considering that he was a lesser one on the original, who barely added anything into the story. Now, knowing his background and knowing that he truly felt sorry for what he did, makes it a really strong character. Ada was unable to understand his arc, but I think that he would have probably explained more of his past with Umbrella so she would have understood his need to make things right. Also, it surprises me that she or Wesker never mentioned his past on Umbrella, considering that Hannigan sends Leon a report about that. Another thing about Luis is that he was able to showcase his skills. We don't see it directly, but after losing his laboratory and getting back to his feet thanks to Ada, he effortlessly did the sedatives. Again, sadly, Ada didn't have the chance to see Luis' redemption. But I have to say that I think it's really badass that thanks to her, we assure Leon and Ashley's survival. While in the original she escapes after talking with Leon for the first time, only to come back to the exact same room seconds later, here it makes sense that she leaps throughout the window since it's the only way to access this new treasury area and after solving a puzzle get a part of the medicine. Talking about this, the new places that we explore as Ada are very interesting. The village is the list of places with new areas, which makes sense. The only new Ada exclusive area in the village is some upper mines that directly connect with the church. On the castle, we got into a new upper tower area with Luis that directly connects through our chapter to the sun and moon lever puzzle. We also go to Luis's laboratory, a new place called Hall of Tribulation, which I mentioned earlier. We go there after our first encounter with Leon. Here we have a ringing bells type of puzzle. The thing I love the most is that once we do that puzzle, a huge drill comes out of nowhere and we are forced to do the same puzzle but backwards. This totally pays homage to the drill that we encounter with Leon and Ashley on the original game and to other Resident Evil games since every time that we are in a fancy place there's gonna be a lot of booby traps. There's a new spooky treasure area fueled by armaduras, a collector's room, the waterways, the little arena with one garrador and tons of enemies, the upper part of the furnace on the mines, the new battle area of the U3 which is almost the same as the original when it is the first phase, and the new mini mines next to the clock tower with the rock traps. On the island, we can go up on one of the buildings located nearby on the area where Ashley helped us using a breaking ball. There is the new cry card area that connects to another new area that is filled with miniguns that replaces the boat section on the original. And finally, this area directly connects with the new comms center where Martinico and the laser room is. The place that got the most new rooms and new things to look at is the castle, which seems fitting because a common problem will surge there, Pesanta. 
first, let me explain. Pesanta is a monster from Catalan folklore, said to be a heavy, black and hairy dog with steel paws that haunts your nightmare. They actually chose a great one since it fits with the hallucinations that she creates. Also, let's do a quick reminder about Pesanta's origin. Near the throne room, while playing as Leon, we find a document, Chronicles of Pursuit 2, that was written by Isidro Uriarte Talavera, aka El Verdugo. Here, he explains that the housekeeper volunteered herself for the experiments, since he wanted to find a way to merge a human with insects. He succeeds, and after a couple of months, he renames her as U3. You see, you two are the Novistadores, so the housekeeper was the last evolution of the chain. Also, it makes sense why the devs decided to give a name to El Verdugo, Isidro Urarte Talavera. Uriarte is his last name, so the Novistadores, U2, and Pesanta, U3, are now part of his legacy. Pesanta will pursue us a couple of times. She infects us at the beginning, not only as a way to frighten us via hallucinations, but serves as a way to track us. That's why she's unable to keep following us after using Louis' sedative. I think that we all got really surprised that the very first enemy that you fight in the entire game is a boss fight, which if you're not careful, you can actually die. As I mentioned, every time that we hallucinate, my mind goes directly to the ghosts and all the paranormal stuff presented on RE 3.5. The devs did their job and their best shot to take elements from there and bring them to the remake. I mean, the way that Leon grabs his flashlight is 1 to 1 to 3.5. Maybe the devs talk about this, maybe not, but I think it was a wasted opportunity that they didn't use the hookman, neither on the base game nor this DLC. I hope they add him as a boss on the mercenaries. Anyway, I really like that they add urgency with Pesanta, and like the first fight, the second one is tough as well. Pesanta receives her final transformation on the arena that is nearby the hive. Here we just have to unload everything that we have, and gladly we can actually parry many of her attacks. Her second phase has interesting moves. One of them really caught me by surprise, since I wasn't expecting for her to be cheating on the roof, just like Queen Dogma. Talking about this moment, something that I really appreciate is that one of the few things that was fully cut was the card section before fighting U3 on the original game. Like the lava room, it never made much sense why there was something like that there, but again, it is something that I don't miss and it's not a big deal. The visuals the graphics, and the way that Ada interacts with the world is as good and great as the base game. The game has lots of cutscenes that enhance our experience. Now comes something that I've been dreading to talk about, Lily Gao. First of all, I wanna be clear, please stop harassing her. If you want to be upset with anybody, be upset with the direction that they decided to give her. If you still want to be upset, go ahead and be upset, but stop harassing an actress that did the job that she was told to do. Having said that, I found Lily's acting as Ada totally fine. It wasn't as terrible as certain scenes on the base game, though here and there are also some questionable voice directing choices as well. But for the most part, it's absolutely fine. In fact, I started to really like her portrayal, because I think she nailed the feeling of how Ada should be, a slick spy, in contrast to the original, where she is more a femme fatale. She is playful with Luis, softer with Wesker, and passionate with Leon. Again, nothing mind-blowing, but definitely isn't the disaster that everyone expected to be. So. Kudos to Lily for sticking with her guns. A final addition that they added was the interaction with Ashley. Sure, it truly wasn't anything bombastic or special, but the fact that both of them acknowledged the other was awesome. Also, everyone thought that Ada helped them to get rid of Leon's parasite, which I'm glad that they didn't, since it adds more agency to Ashley. Now, there's another situation that I wanna tackle, Wesker. I was truly really baffled when he appeared out of nowhere, since it really felt like Wesker et Machina. 
I guess the only reason they did that was to avoid creating a new character or confusing the timeline by Louise helping her out. But personally, I think it would have been better if the merchant was the one who did it. In fact, it would have been fitting that he requested some treasure as a payment, maybe from the castle. But honestly, it really came out of nowhere since Wesker's appearance on the original was reduced to be only on Ada's call and be a playable character on the mercenaries. Of course, the devs explained this by showing that his center of operations is on a giant boat, but I cannot shake the feeling that if he was there, he should have done something. A new change that he has is that he didn't hire Krauser, or at least there aren't any hints about that. And now, he literally doesn't care in the slightest about Leon. A little detail that I liked is that Ada's attitude changes when he threatens her in her face to get the amber. I think that this, coupled with everything that happens, is the start of her doubts about working with him. I still don't understand the syringe that he holds here. Did he inject something or gather a sample? I've been thinking about that, but honestly, I don't know. It could be that he administered something so she wakes up faster. At any rate, it's very clear that Wesker's appearance wasn't something random or for the lols. I think it was a way to test the waters with the remake version of him. I mean, think about it, he's the main antagonist up until RE5. A very welcome addition to the game is the music. Whereas the base game was really atmospheric and moody, Separate Ways throws that to the window. The music here is way more lively. I was pleasantly surprised when I had my first interaction with the merchant since I wasn't expecting another remake of Serenity, the piece that is the saving and the merchant's theme on the original game. On Leon's side, it was extremely moody, but they remade it once again just for Ada, which makes it really recognizable right away. Another huge one plays on the castle, Infiltration. Personally, I consider that piece as Resident Evil 4 Anthem. It was remade on the base game, but again, it was super moody. But here, once more, they made it more lively. Also, every boss fight will have their own new track, while the ones that were present on the base game, like the music that causes frenetic tension in the village with Leon, is back to frighten us. Finally, the game has some little easter eggs throughout the entire run, like the chicken on the oven on Vitore's house, killing Ashley crying in the church, a ganado dropping some glasses after ringing the bell, or one ganado very close to the end that is wearing Krauser's beret. I don't know if this one is considered an easter egg, but when we are able to explore the village, all the windows are intact, except the window where we get the shotgun. The only thing that's destroyed is the inside of the tower, meaning it's canon that Leon goes up and gets a nasty surprise but he didn't destroy anything else. I'm sure there are many more easter eggs that I missed, but I encourage you to go and hunt them. Separate Ways, in its totality, took me around 6 hours to complete. For the price tag of 10 bucks, plus all the new elements they added, including a real backstory and a solid reason for Ara to be in this nightmarish hell, I can't say nothing more but my praises to all the devs who work on this project. Any DLC from any game should receive this type of treatment. Overall, the remake version of Separate Ways gives more agency to Ada, and it conveys her character through her words and action. She is a true spy with a soft heart. Playing as her feels like you are a spy and not just a simple Leon reskin. She's quick and snappy. She uses her arsenal to her favor, but when the action calls, she's able to fully utilize her martial skills. Long gone are the days of absolute goofiness, though she is mixed some sassy comments here and there. To me, the most important aspect of her adventure is that she isn't behind Leon's back. Unlike Resident Evil 4, the devs really thought about why she was there. They didn't just add her because she was her companion on Resident Evil 2. For the most part, we barely interact with Leon, but indirectly, she helped them to succeed. Well, 
we are almost done with the video, so I want to add some speculation about the future of the franchise. I think it's pretty obvious that they are gonna remake both Code Veronica and Resident Evil 5. By showing Wesker here, they open that can of worms. The logic tells me that they should remake first Code Veronica and later 5, but I have no idea what the devs are planning. One thing is for sure, as long as the remakes maintain the same quality, I really don't mind the order. I've read a lot of people complaining about changes and cuts done to the remix, and all I can add is that if I wanted to play the originals, I would go ahead and play the originals. The only time that I get upset with remix is when they make the original game unavailable or difficult to play. And yes, I'm talking about you, Warcraft 3 Reforge. The other occasion is when the remakes are abysmal, which RE4 Remake isn't. Also, let me clarify, I'm not saying that remakes have to deviate, but in the particular case of this game, I welcome all the changes that they made. I think it's clear that they want to retell the story of the games pre-Resident Evil seeds and make them more cohesive instead of separate games with common themes. I believe that Capcom's goal, with all the remakes that they have done, is to make the future games more interesting. We have to remember, they made a soft reboot with Resident Evil 7, and I think they want to nicely merge this remake timeline with that soft reboot. I am truly excited, because I want to see this polished version of Claire, Steve and Shiva, and since they canonized it on Village, I am truly curious to know how they're gonna tackle the punching boulder moment. Separate Ways feels like an amazing cut of fresh paint to Ada and Resident Evil 4 Remake. In general, it feels like a love letter to the fans, to the genre, and to the franchise. As many of you, I think that this is one of the best eras that Capcom have ever been, and I hope that they stay like that. Since the Winter story is over, I hope that familiar faces from the remix make their big comeback in future games, but no matter what, I hope that Resident Evil stays as strong as it has been for the last 6 years. I wanna give special thanks to my friend Momojo for lending her voice. Also, I wanna thank you for watching my video. I am really curious to read your comments and know what do you think about Separate Ways. Did you like it? Did you agree or disagree with me about the future of the franchise? Also, don't forget to subscribe and give me a like if you enjoyed the video. And if you want a more Resident Evil 4 Remake content, I have happy news. I made an analysis of the game explaining the importance of Leo's Wall Thrower. Interested? Go ahead and check it out or check any of my current playthroughs. See you around.